We spent some time with David yesterday and just hung out with him, and he's a pretty cool guy. So I think we're, we're very lucky to um, have him come speak at Agile NZ this year. Uh, he's presenting on a topic called Growing Agile Leaders, The Inconvenient Truth. So David has an unusual set of skills, and he'll perform his, one of his unusual set of skills by reappearing from the black curtain in front of you later. Uh, and he has a deep technical and human kind of, he applies a deep technical and human aspects to software development. Um, in addition to his background as a system architect and software developer, David holds a degree in group dynamics and has completed formal training in creative problem solving, advanced facilitation, innovative games facilitation, and non-violent communication. <laughs> Co-active coaching, organize, and the list goes on for a long while, so I want to read all the things. Uh, David has worked with organizations of all shapes and sizes, including Fortune 500 to community-based nonprofit organizations. His passionate focus on collaboration and clear communication supports effective agile business consulting, leadership and management coaching, and team facilitation training and coaching. If we can just give a round of applause as David appears behind the curtains, I'd like to welcome David Chilcott. Am I on? Am I on? You guys can hear me? Cool. So welcome. Um, I'm assuming because we tried to make it so that everyone has a handout and a card. And hopefully everyone has a writing implement. That might have been a false assumption on my part, that people would come to a conference with something to write with. <laughs> um, and while I think of it, um, I, I want to invite you to think back over uh, to the very beginning of the conference when Lisa and Michael asked you to kind of think about and kind of try to identify what quadrants or perspectives um, are active, and so I'll sort of plant that seed. So while we're while we're doing this, um, see if you can figure out which perspectives are being invoked at any particular time. Um, we're going to start the, this presentation is half presentation, half exercise. We're going to go back and forth between them. So we're going to start with an exercise, and you will need your index card and a writing implement for that part. And this is solo work. So for yourself, with yourself, think of a tense or an edgy situation that you were in recently. One-on-one, um, -on -one, um, a meeting, and I want to invite you to be really specific um, and jot down some notes and kind of the key points, that, the key points so that you can kind of work with it and remember it. Who came in and they were a little edged out or having challenges or emotional stuff. Um, and what happened next? What did you do or not do? And how effective was it? So I'm going to give you just a few minutes to come up with that scenario and write down just enough. You don't need to do the whole story, but just enough so that you, it's specific in your mind. And if anyone doesn't have one, make one up.
So take another 20 seconds, 30 seconds, wherever you got to is fine. And I want to draw your attention to the last uh, bullshit bullet point there, um, which is how effective was the result, and apply a percent adjustment to it. You know, figure you're rating it on a scale of one to 10. I want both parts of your brain activated. I want the part that tells stories, and I want the part that's measuring stuff. Okay, so this is what uh, I'm hoping you're here for, because this is my purpose for this talk, which is introduce a powerful perspective uh, and tools to support your growth as an Agile leader. And hopefully by the end of this session, you'll have an overview of the Leadership 360 model, which is one tool uh, that's pretty powerful from a leadership perspective. You'll have identified some specific strategies for working with reactive tendencies, that'll make more sense later. Um, and you'll know how to deepen your own and others' learning. Uh, and we'll have touched on a few inconvenient truths uh, about Agile and Agile leadership. So this is, as I mentioned before, is gonna be a mix of presentation and exercises. Uh, in service of deepening your learning. Um, there is a tremendous amount of material, this um, sourced from a day-long workshop, and then I cut it down to 90 minutes, and then I found out I had 50 minutes. Uh, so we're gonna be drinking from the fire hose. Um, so I would invite you to hold your questions, except if you're not understanding the instructions for the exercises. And I will try to leave some time at the end. Um, so because we're gonna be drinking from the fire hose, I wanna invite you to allow the presentation and the exercise to just sort of wash over you, that you're, you're really not, um, I want you to prioritize kind of the sense of it, of the flavor of things, rather than uh, trying to hold and capture all the details or the specific content. The materials will be um, available Afterwards, I'll make them available. So don't worry about capturing stuff. Worry about sort of how it lands inside you. Um, that's an old picture. You can obviously tell. And since you guys heard my introduction, I'm going to skip that part. <laughs> so I want to um, introduce you to... Um, three of our leadership pitfalls. Um, this is that go-to place that happens when we're under stress. And um, I really mean us, because all of us uh, have these. They're alive in us. And um, so we're gonna, they're essentially, we're looking at three different ways that uh, happen to you when you get triggered, um, and, or when you have insufficient resource for the situation that you're facing. The first one is complying chase. And uh, you might be a complying chase if you're uh, cautiously managing what you say uh, to stay in the good graces um, of others. You might be a complying chase if you're a do-gooder or when you're often finding yourself saying yes instead of saying when you might really want to say no. Um, you might be a complying chase if you're calibrating what's happening in a meeting carefully uh, to, s to make sure that it's safe for you to speak. You're double checking with authorities before taking action. You're couching your speech so other people you know, won't have strong emotional responses for it. 
So listen as we're saying these characteristics. Listen for those things that might actually be resonant or true for you. Protecting Paula. You might be protecting Paula if you're used to holding back and watching how situations unfold. If you're identifying what is wrong or illogical or lacking in plans, if that's just kind of what you do by default. If you're good at seeing the fault in others' thinking, speaking, or actions. And if you're often analyzing what is right and what is wrong. You might be controlling Chris if you're often competing with your other team members. If you're setting exacting standards, if you're striving for perfection, if you're using authority to take charge and influence to get your own way, if you're exerting tremendous effort and energy to achieve your goals, if you often speak directly and bluntly, if you're pushing yourself and others to win, and if you are taking charge in most situations, if that's your go-to strategy. So now we're going to do part two of the opening exercise. And this requires you to be in conversation with two or three, with one other or two other people. So form pairs or triads. <laughs> Hang on one sec. That was a facilitator error. There's a little more instruction. Um, the key piece here is your job as a pair is to fill out your card with what you think that behavior is that's most likely, either in you or in others, and label your card. Do not, I repeat, do not get stuck back into the story. You don't need to tell the story. You need to help each other fill out which of those three types of behavior are, uh, were alive in that situation. OK, go ahead.
That beats the heck out of me yelling at you guys. Shut up! So, quick straw poll. This is a uh, raise your hands. How many identified complying behaviors in others? Raise your hand. Raise them high and look around because you're going to want to know kind of this rough distribution. Whoops. Protecting behaviors in others. Look around. Controlling behavior in others. <laughs> okay, now comes the fun part. So, um, what did you notice about the distribution in the room? Any, any uh, quick observation about that? Yeah, a couple. I, it was pretty even. It looked to me a little bit like, and I've got a special seat because I can see better, um, controlling one by just a little bit, but it was pretty even. Okay, next part. How many of you identified complying behaviors in yourself? Raise your hand. So look around. High, 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 hands high. Protecting behaviors in yourself. And controlling behaviors in yourself. Huh. It is pretty even. It's because we're in New Zealand, I think. <laughs> so that, that kind of leads us into the first of the inconvenient truths. That leadership is, it starts with us. That it's inescapable. That we have to do our own work. And it's not about pointing it out there or blaming other people or blaming the leaders in your organization if you're not one and, you know, the pesky employees if you are a leader in your organization. So I invite you to uh, look to keep that, uh, for the rest of that perspective for the rest of the presentation and see... Uh, if you can find some things that make sense for you in terms of your own work. So we're going to do a quick pass through a couple of um, slides. Most of this is not new. Um, it's really just to repeat the, the primary message, I think, that we're hearing in terms of transformation, doing and being, which is that I think we're experiencing um, a big shift uh, in the world from a mechanistic perspective um, through the challenge and dis-ease, um, the lack of ease, um, which is what happens when we change worldviews. Um, and we're, we're moving to a more emergent or biological um, model of how things work. Um, Again, there's a whole bunch of material. I'm just going to touch on it really lightly, so allow it to wash over you. So in com leadership in, in complex adaptive systems um, and the transition from complicated systems, which are the things that we think we can know, to adaptive systems where we've you know, determined that it's not actually knowable, kind of look like this. That we're moving from a place of role defining, where we're setting jobs and task descriptions and such, to um, moving towards kind of working with um, relationships and the patterns of interactions in your system, which is about building relationships. We're moving from a way where we're making decision making, which is that it's our job as a leader to find the best decision and make the best choice, to the idea that we're involved in, the, in a cooperative or collective sense making activity. Um, we're helping tell the stories that we need to hear in our organizations that um, give things meaning. That we're moving from kind of tight structuring to, which is kind of the chain of command and uh, having uh, clear limits and prioritized actions and kind of tracking at the level of a great detail to a more a kind of more loose coupling, which is the, that we're um, moving to support communities communities of practice, for example, and we're opening them up to add more degrees of freedom. We're moving from um, a place where we 
think we can know and that we then decide and tell others what to do to a, more, a greater emphasis on learning. So this is that act, learn, plan cycle that um, is probably familiar to most people here. And then we're moving from a kind of staying the course, which is that since we have clear roles and we have decision making and we are telling people what to do um, and we kind of think we know what they do, we're going to just go ahead and stay the course. We have a plan, we're sticking to it, independent of what reality is telling us. And um, in an adaptive system, leadership uh, looks more like we're building relationships, we're making sense of that together. This is a shared story. Um, loose coupling, more degrees of freedom, the work is closer to where the work is happening, and that we're also emphasizing learning. And it allows the organization and the people and the leaders to sense um, emergent directions. So we're now being influenced by um, and building on what works in real time. So another aspect of this is that there are these tensions. There's on the command and control side, which is where we're moving away from and to, into, quote, agile leadership. Um, you know, there's, are we prioritizing efficiency or are we prioritizing capability, uh, creativity? Um, how big is our tolerance for uh, certainty or ambiguity, planning or emergence, decision making? Um, you know, there's always this trade-off that we make on a day-to-day -day basis between, you know, how much are we going to emphasize delivery, like actually moving product or uh, information through our system, and how much are we going to prioritize building our own capability, the organization's capability. That tension is real and it doesn't go away. So the next inconvenient truth here is that these tensions cannot be resolved. And we really want them to be resolved because it makes us, you know, feel better. But they can, however, be managed, they can be held, they can be balanced. And it will be a continuous process. It's not something that's ever going to be done. And it's a dimension or an aspect of leadership. Um, we sometimes substitute, you know, our agile certainty for our, you know, complicated system certainty. But it doesn't actually serve us. Another aspect of this that I think is important, in, particularly in the relationship to change and change management, is that in any change process, um, humans inherently feel um, a sense of loss or the loss of possibility. They're fear or, feared or real losses. And that's not something to skip over. It's something to, you know, uh, acknowledge as we move towards more adaptive work and more adaptive work styles, leadership becomes, includes allowing that to happen and giving that space. But it, it's also about recognizing what's precious or uh, in our current situation um, and acknowledging that and bringing what's precious forward with us and allowing time for that. In, in a sense, it's kind of a quality of grieving. And um, we as individuals have that, but we also have this in teams and in our organizations. So that's a part of the dance with these tensions. So one uh, tool that's kind of useful for um, working with leadership, this, I'm sure many of you have heard of this or have seen it. Who, who's actually um, had done a pr profile or uh, has heard of it? So, a, a, a few, a fair number. Um, I was going to say keep me honest, but I don't want you to. <laughs> so, um, this is going to be, a, a, yet again, a whirlwind um, tour. And what I'm uh, intending to do is just, just introduce you to the basic pieces of it. Um, and then we're going to do uh, an exercise um, to invite you into a felt sense of what these uh, pieces mean that will lead us to um, uh, deepening our exercise about crafting strategies for working with the um, reactive tendencies. So, super quickly, 
The top of the circle is about creative competencies. Um, and we'll, you'll see that this is uh, on your handout. The bottom is reactive styles. Left hand is people, right hand is tasks. And um, the, I think for me, one of the, the most impressive and highest impact things about this was to suddenly recognize well, th with more than a half a million data points, um, they've got pretty serious statistical correlation between leadership effectiveness and reactive and creative behaviors based on their instrument. Um, it, for those of you who are also propeller heads, that's a really serious correlation. A little bit less on the reactive side, but... Um, so essentially, part of this is that it makes good sense um, for you to be become fluent in at least understanding what the difference between reactive and creative. So find your handout on one side of it. It looks like this. Um, will be, um, it, this is kind of about invoking the wheel. I want to invite you to put your hand, to literally put your finger in the wedge. Um, trust me, it's probably useful for you to just get a grounding in your body. Um, and allow yourself to have a felt sense, an embodied sense of the dimension as you follow along. It's going to be really fast, so um, just allow that to flow over you. So a quick spin through the creative competencies. In the space of relating, your capability to rate, relate to others in a way that brings out the best in people, groups, and organizations. You provide a supportive climate. You focus on developing teams and helping people reach their potential. People flourish under your leadership. You tend to move towards relationships, caring for people, and supporting others in, is part of a creative expression of who you are. Oops. In the land of self-awareness, your orientation is to ongoing professional and personal development, as well as the degree to which inner self-awareness is expressed through balanced perspectives, insight, and high-integrity leadership. You are trusted to walk your talk. You lead in a way that strengthens the innate capabilities of those who work with you. This allows you to surround yourself with very capable people and celebrate their achievements. Move on to authenticity. Authenticity is the degree to which you walk your talk, keep your commitments, and communicate, communicate courageously and lead with integrity. Your inner and outer lives are congruent. Your power in the organization is not primarily based on where you are in the hierarchy. You are able to express honestly what you feel. And you're not afraid to provide direct feedback, and you don't run away from conflict. In the space of systems awareness, that's the degree to which your awareness is focused on whole system improvement and on community welfare. You lead with the big picture in view. You don't jump to fix systems, symptoms. You look for a root cause. You care more and more about using the organization and your leadership as instruments for bettering the welfare of life globally. In the space of achieving, that's the extent to which you offer visionary, purposeful, and high achievement leadership. You tend to empower others by modeling and teaching your creative process. You have a deep sense of purpose and create out of love for the result or the process of creating. Just let that settle in for a moment. Imagine what becomes possible 
when you have this amount or this type of inner resource? What does that make possible for you and for your organizations? So moving on, welcome to the dark side. We'll be focusing on creating strategies for the reactive stuff, so listen with that in mind. Uh, in particular, listen, uh, see if you can identify your kind of default strategy, the, either your personal one or the one that was uh, active in your slice, in, sorry, in your um, scenario that was on your card. So complying, the energy of complying is conservative, pleasing, belonging, passive. Complying Chris, it's the extent to which you form your sense of self out of what others expect of you rather than what you intend and want. Your internal assumptions are, I'm okay if people like me. I'm worthy when others approve of me. I need to live up to others' expectations to succeed. The world is a dangerous place. Caution makes me safe. We touched on the behaviors before when we were talking about complying Chris, um, saying yes when you really want to say no, calibrating the emotional climate, that kind of thing. But let's also recognize that um, complying has some strengths. Complying, Chris is able to recognize and respond to the needs of others. They're very reliable, capable of sensing others' emotions, going the extra mile, maintaining loyalty, being easy to talk to, serving others. Move on to the protecting. The energy of protecting is arrogant, critical, distant. It's the belief that you can protect yourself and establish a sense of worth through withdrawal, remaining distance, hidden. The internal assumptions are, for me to be right, others have to be wrong, and vice versa. I'm worthwhile if I'm right and find weaknesses in others. I'm not good enough. I'm safe and acceptable if I remain small, uninvolved, and avoid risk. Just notice how that might be landing in your body if you recognize some of these characteristics. But protecting Paula also has some strengths. She's able to cut through complexity and see the issues that others miss. Remain detached and observant when things get emotional. She's able to care deeply for a few people or causes. She protects her active interior or spiritual life. And she's capable of offering a great deal of wisdom. So on to controlling. The energy of controlling is perfect, perfection, driven, ambition, autocratic. Controlling is the extent to which you establish your sense of personal worth through task accomplishment and personal achievement. Your, inner, your internal assumptions are, I stay safe by taking charge. Only the strong survive, and I will be one of them. I need to triumph over others to feel good about myself. The world is made up of winners and losers. Failure of any proportion could lead to my demise. We touched on the behaviors in the, in the first part of the exercise, striving for protection, speaking directly and bluntly, et cetera. But there are some strengths. Um, controlling Chris has, which is there's a propensity to pursue continuous improvement, uh, excel in many different situations, 
create results, influence others. Um, you're willing to share your opinions even if they're controversial. And you're really good at taking charge and actually getting into action. So write down on your card, what do you think your dominant reactive style is? This leads to the third inconvenient truth, that in order to deepen and support our own leadership, we need to manage our reactive tendencies in order to be able to powerfully influence the work that needs to happen. Nobody gets out of here unscathed. So hopefully you have a sense of what these are, um, kind of the felt sense of them, um, and are able to uh, feel what it's like when you're being pulled into your reactive behaviors, or at least had a sense of resonance when things that were true about you were spoken. We're going to return to our uh, pair or triad work. Um, and I'm going to invite you to um, work on the other side of your worksheet. So again, I want you to look at your scenario and don't revisit it in great depth. Don't tell the story. Talk about uh, what potential strategies were, and actually fill out your form. You can pick which of the reactive tendencies you want to work with based on either what you, who you are or what was active or alive in your scenario, and come up with um, two strategies and one strength that are applicable. And we'll have about five minutes for this. Go ahead.
guys need a little more time or a little more? I got one yep, so no one else said no. All right, take another minute. Cool. So this is the fourth inconvenient truth, that as individuals and as leaders, we're responsible for our own experience and self-management, regardless of whether we're the boss, a subordinate, or a peer. But this is also kind of the source of um, an opportunity as well which is that when we're responsible for our experience, we can be leaderful in all of our situations and all of our roles. Whether we're the boss, a subordinate, or a peer, that we're most effective as leaders when we serve others to become more resourceful. And it's our own practice that allows us to develop our inner resource and to become more resourceful. And then it's our job as leaders to help others to do that. And that's really the promise of agile leadership. So that's the presentation. I'm open for, I'd love to hear some highlights or learnings or questions. Thanks, David. Any questions from the audience? Got one back there. So let me make sure I'm understanding. I think your question was, what happens when there's more than one person who's controlling and you're sort of at loggerheads? I have no idea. <laughs> no, the, the work there is, um, how do you respond in a way that's unique to that moment rather than being reactive? And it's hard. It's hard work. And almost certainly, we're going to all make a lot of mistakes here. but. The more mi mistakes we make, the faster we learn how to sort of manage that. Um, and fundamentally, it's, I think, also returning to a sense that um, we're really allies, even though we might not feel that way in the moment. I hope that was helpful. Uh, Lisa? Um, a highlight for me, I just wanted to let you know, was even though I know the leadership circle really well, as you were reading out each of the things about each of the quadrants and I was moving my finger all around that circle and I could close my eyes and envision it, I really understood it much deeper, even though I've been studying this for a long time. And so I just wanted to thank you for that highlight. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, the, the instrument that you showed us, is, is there an, an online evaluation tool or is there some sort of way, is it a 360? 
Yes. Yeah. Cool. Um, and I'd be interested to hear who's who's doing that. Um, it's the what's the name? Leadership 360. Um, and I don't actually right now. I'm spacing on the name because you just asked me what it was. Um, but yes, it's available. Um, it's an online instrument. Um, you would become certified or find somebody who can administer it to either you or a team or an organization. Um, and they've been around a long time. The instrument's actually really elegant, um, like jaw-droppingly so, if, if you have any propeller-headed tendencies like myself. It's like, <gasps> it's just beautiful. Um, but it's also really effective, and it's useful from the standpoint of um, getting pretty rigorous feedback about so let's just say that my experience of getting that was, um, apart from just recognizing what a beautiful instrument was, was like painful. Um, because it was like, huh, ouch. <laughs> um, but it also helps um, identify some t territories or areas where um, you could focus your own personal growth or coaching work. So. One more question. Oh, complying. <laughs> how, how much time? I've got a really long back history, childhood trauma, all kinds of stuff, you know. <laughs> awesome. Um, on that note, thank you, David. Just all right. Thank you again. Thank you.